Hello and uh, welcome and uh, to the last uh, uh, presentation of this track today, which is with uh, with Acast. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Laliberté and I'm an equity uh, research analyst here at ABG, covering primarily media stocks and investment company stocks. Uh, I'm thrilled to have uh, Acast with me uh, today, uh, which. Um, uh, which posted a very strong uh, quarter, uh, the last one since becoming a, the first one since becoming a public uh, company. Uh, and with us uh, from Acast, we have um, uh, Ross Adams, CEO, and we have Emily Villat, uh, CFO. And uh, with that, uh, please go ahead, Acast, with your roughly 20-minute uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, thereafter, we will have a Q&A session. session. Uh, please Great. go ahead. Thanks very much, and thank you, ABG, for hosting this and inviting us for the last slot. Hopefully, the last slot is the most exciting slot. Um, so let's uh, kick it off and try and be uh, as, as quick as we can and as efficient as we can and engaging as we can. Um, em, do you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. I'm Emily Villat, the CFO of Acast. I came into the business a bit over two years ago, having spent some 12 years in financial services in a big corp FTSE 250 business. Most of that time in London and internationally in Sydney, but I've been spending my last number of years in my hometown of uh, Stockholm, and that is also where I'm based right now. Over to you, Ross. Great. Uh, as you can see, Ross Adams, CEO of the business, I'm based out of UK, um, just outside of London. A bit about my background, ground, which uh, is relevant to where I find myself today. I spent my first 10 years of my career working for um, Capital Radio, which is now called Global Radio, so the biggest radio group in the UK, learning how to monetize audio through advertising. I was then lucky enough to meet um, a chap called Daniel Eck of Spotify, who pitched the concept and idea back in 2008. Um, I joined the team, uh, the early crew, 30 of us in the business, and we launched the business. My role was uh, to launch the UK with two others, and uh, I was in charge of the uh, monetizing the free version, again, monetizing the audio through ads and helping them expand across the globe, obviously learning a huge amount. I was there for six years, uh, and then I met another inspiring Swede in Johan Bilgren, who's the founder of Acast and I couldn't resist joining and copy repeating the success I had at Spotify. I've been with Acast the full seven years of its history um, and have loved every minute of it and been CEO now for um, four years next month. So let's crack on with the presentation. Apologies to those who've seen some of these slides, but I think it's um, really important to those who don't know us to understand exactly how Acast operates and how the podcast industry as a whole operates because it's quite different from other mediums as mentioned. So here, uh, the best way to explain it is with a great analogy, and this is looking at how the internet works. So for example, if you are a creator and a web page creator in this instance, you need to host that content somewhere and you know, we've chosen WordPress as the example. So WordPress, you'll host and that will distribute your website for you via HTML to all of the different web browsers there are out there today. So it might be that you might surf uh, the, to that web page using Chrome, I might use Safari, but as an internet user, we're still surfing to that same destination, which is hosted in the same place. Podcasting works in exactly the same way. We are an infrastructure play. Um, so essentially, if you have a podcast, you need to host, distribute, and monetize that. Now, rather than HTML, we distribute through something called RSS technology, and we distribute to all the different places out there you can listen to a podcast. And here you can see an example of the pod catchers. We call them the podcast apps, and there's over 250 different podcast apps there, and you can access that content. But essentially, when you push play, regardless of the platform you're using, as soon as you push play, it fetches it, the show via RSS from ACAS as the host. We understand some data about who you are, the content you're listening to. We find relevant ads, relevant sponsorships. We inject those dynamically and digitally, and we send those back, and we monetize that listen. So you might be listening on the podcaster app, or you might be listening on Spotify to that piece of content. We're the ones who are monetizing it. We're the ones streaming it to that platform, and we're sharing that revenue we're making through ads directly with the creator, the end platform, makes no money. All they get is they get free content to deliver to their uh, listeners. So if you look at last year in 2020, we delivered 3 billion listens across all of our countries. Um, but if you look at the platforms and how it's broken down, 
it helps you understand how fragmented podcasting is. Podcasting is a 20-year-old medium. Apple were at the beginning of it, hence the name podcast. It came from the word iPod. But essentially, they are the, you know, they have over 60% of market share. If you'd spoken just five years ago, that would have been, you know, close to 90%. More and more in, um, platforms have now launched into the space and are offering podcast listening. Um, the sweet spot in the middle there is, you know, a quarter of all listening happened last year with our shows on independent podcast pure players. And then if you look at the growing part of this pie, it's the music platforms. Um, so as you can see there, the likes of Spotify, iHeart, Deezer, et cetera. And more recently, you've seen the likes of Amazon and even the likes of Audible join the space and soon to be the likes of Facebook. But this market is entirely fragmented. But regardless, if you want your show to reach the largest audience, you need to be on every single platform and you need a simple technology that monetizes, distributes your show with a simple drag and drop technology, which is what ACAST does. We are platform agnostic. So if you think about how we've attracted, you know, it's 31,000 shows now, you know, the, the core about our strategy is to become the marketplace to um, control the supply coming in and the demand from advertisers and um, service those two sides of the pie. So as I said today, we represent you know, some of the largest creators in over um, 12 markets, delivering content to 155 different countries actually. Um, and we're growing by thousands of shows every single month, servicing over 4,000 advertisers. And again, that grows year over year as more advertisers get used to podcast buying. But our goal is to basically be the gatekeeper of every financial transaction that happens within podcasting. And we're looking at new monetization options as well through the likes of podcast subscription, which I can mention in brief later on. Um, here you can see exactly where podcasting uh, is distributed to and how ACAST makes money. So we deliver not only to those podcast players we deliver through the likes of the web through the likes of um, different platforms so um, the likes of alexas and smart speakers wherever you are pushing play or asking to push play on a podcast it's us delivering that um, out there in the industry so if you look at the seven year history as you can see here from the chart we've effectively doubled our revenue year over year. But if, let's go back to the beginning when we launched in Sweden in 2014. Uh, in Europe, there was no podcast market from a commercial standpoint at all. No advertisers were buying podcasts at all. So we came along and disrupted the space using digital technology. So we invented dynamic ad insertion, which is the norm um, technology wise today but we were the first to do it. And we were the first to apply those digital metrics, those one by one tracking pixels, which digital media expects. So, you know, we had to apply those if we were to attract those digital budgets across to using us. However, we had to educate the ad market on how to buy podcasting. Um, so the reason why we started to sign those key publishers, you'll see the likes of Afton Blood at Dargan's there, The Economist, the FT, was because advertisers and the media agencies were buying those media brands in other ad formats. And so it wasn't a huge leap of faith to trial out podcast um, buying because those brands attracted the advertisers to the space. Behind them, we represented thousands of other shows and we introduced them to those after they got comfortable with podcast buying. But what we found straight away, especially with English spoken content, is that content travels. So if you look at the likes of The Economist, the FT, some of our publishers, 30 to 40 percent of their reach actually happened and the listens happened outside of the UK. So if we're to be fully efficient at monetizing those listens, we needed to have feet on the ground in each of those markets where their content was being consumed en masse. That also gave us a good roadmap of where we should be launching in next. And as you can see there, there's a lot of English spoken frags across the top, but essentially we've copy repeated that first mover model and first mover advantage. America being the only market where a commercial podcasting market existed in a different format, which we've now disrupted and changed. And the market is now buying in the way that we sell. Um, not much more probably to say on this one. 
All right. So if we look at how those ad revenues break down, you'll see here that more than 90% of our revenues come from um, ads. There's a small part of non-ad revenue on the side where we have the likes of SaaS and uh, subscription revenues. And Ross will touch more on that subscription piece later on. But if we go back to the ad revenues, there are two main formats that we deliver. Uh, Brand ads that are those pre-recorded um, ads from brands, we typically split them 50-50 with our creators. And if you're a podcast listener, you might have heard those host read or sponsorship ads where the podcaster themselves would actually deliver the ad creative. So in that instance, the standard is a 70-30 split with those creators. Um, but mind you, the pricing and the CPM on that type of ad is higher. So at a gross profit level, after we've taken the revenue and then shared uh, the relevant part with the creator, we still get a beautiful part of the pie. And just back to why this all matters and, and the TAM that is out there that we're going after. If you look at a recent PwC study looking at the global audio market, right now podcasting is just over that 1 billion ad revenue market. And uh, 28 billion US dollars is like for like commercial radio, so radio injecting ads. And that is into a medium that does not have the same digital capabilities. They might have the reach and scale, but not the same ability to target and deliver value to advertisers. And PwC are forecasting that uh, this podcast ad revenue market will grow by a compound annual growth rate of just under 20% in the next number of years. Now, ACAST has had a track record of beating the market and also playing in the part of the market that has the highest growth within it. And, uh, and that's what we have, um, that's what we're intending to continue to do. A little bit deeper into the numbers, Derek was kind enough to, to mention our strong Q2 um, report. We delivered 130% growth in that quarter compared to Q2 um, 2020. Now, we always compare against the same quarter last year due to the seasonality of ad revenues um, that, that come with this space. Now, it was an easier comp last year. We did have an impact of COVID. As you'll see on that right-hand side in Q2 2020, we had, um, for us, a low 22% growth. Now, some of that ad revenue where advertisers paused parts of their spending came back in Q4 of last year. So when we get to that point, that would be a tougher comp. But setting that aside, 130% net sales growth or 134% if discounting the impact of FX is still a result we have to be happy with. We maintain that healthy 37% gross margin. That's also the gross margin that we've indicated uh, to the markets that we're uh, targeting for the foreseeable future. And that might fluctuate quarter over quarter, but um, we have had a good track record of, of holding that healthy gross margin up and actually increasing it over time. Now, in Q2, we did um, list the company's shares and we incurred some costs related to the IPO. But if we set those aside and look at adjusted EBITDA, you know, we um, diligently follow our ability to deliver operating leverage and, um, in essence, scale our OPEX line and evidencing that by reducing our EBITDA loss margin. We've had a strong track record of doing just that in the past and Q2 uh, was no different going from negative 45 Q220 to negative 21 in uh, Q2 of this year. And if we look at our different market segments, Europe, Americas and other markets, we look at their local profitability targets before allocation of overheads to make sure that everyone is carrying their weight and everyone is, is scaling in the right way. And right now, all of my market segments are delivering what we're asking them to do. Europe grow, grew that 174%. Europe did have the biggest impact from COVID uh, in Q2 2020, but regardless of that, it's still a fantastic result. And Europe cannot deliver those types of results without our most established markets, UK and Sweden, delivering um, stellar performances. And what that tells me is that um, 
there is there is no such thing as a mature market in podcasting, even those established markets are are performing really well, where we already have a significant market share. The Americas was really impacted by FX. So if we strip out the impact of the USD to SEK conversion, the Americas delivered. 84% organic uh, sales, uh, net sales growth and went from being in the red uh, at that local profitability line at the at the bottom half of the screen to being in the black. Uh, same thing for other markets. That's mainly our Australian, New Zealand business and our international sales teams. Everyone is delivering uh, what we're asking to do and um, producing great scalability. All right, our listens. We've seen this dynamic in the past and we'll continue to see it in the future. That we'll continue to grow our listens, but we will also um, improve our ability to monetize those listens. We've spoken about the impact of an Apple bug that slightly reduced our uh, Q2 2021 listens to, to what they would have been without this uh, slight reporting issue. But um, we'll get by Q4, we'll get back to a normal baseline. But but regardless of that minor glitch, that same dynamic um, has been seen in past quarters, we're growing our listens and we're also growing our ability to monetize those listens. And it should be said that podcasting is an under monetized medium. So there's, um, we'll, we'll continue to see that dynamic moving forward. Right, Ross, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Okay. So last slide, um, a couple of recent events um, to kind of update you on. We announced a partnership with uh, Crooked Media for international sales. For those of you who don't know Crooked Media, they produce some fantastic shows. Uh, they were founded by a chap called John Favreau, um, John Lovett and Tommy Vita. And these three actually all served as staffers under Barack Obama. Um, and they produce a huge network of incredible shows, basically, which are um, popular political podcasts, one called Pod Save America, Love It or Leave It, but to name a few. So they uh, join us from um, an international sales representation. So we talked before about America being a very different model. You have a lot of local incumbents who do represent themselves, but actually now dynamic ad insertion has become the norm. Um, what they're finding is a big chunk of their listens are international and therefore they do not have sales teams internationally who can monetize that for them, creating opportunities for international sales partnerships like this. We do the same with TED Talks, PRX, and a few others. Um, next up was the British Podcast Awards, which was worth noting, which happened, I believe, back in um, August. Uh, there were 80 awards given out. You know, we have a dominant presence in the UK market, especially of the commercial podcasts. And out of the 80 awards that were given, 40 were awarded to Acast Podcasts. And there was one award, which was the Podcast Champion, which is the ultimate award awarded to a lady called Fern Cotton of Happy Place. Um, and again, Fern hosts her show and monetizes her show with Acast. So we had kind of the dominant presence there. Um, we rolled out our um, technology called Acast Plus. Acast Plus is our subscription technology, allowing creators to build their own paywalls. So if you wanted to release ad-free content, if you wanted to release um, you know, your super fans to subscribe for whatever price you wanted to, but basically access exclusive content on whatever platform they are, um, they can use this Acast Plus technology. We teamed up, um, or we have teamed up with a podcast called Tommy um, Laurietta, Hector and Laurietta. It's an Irish podcast. It does very, very well from an ad sales perspective. Um, they launched with us and ACAS Plus back in March, uh, and they started to see successes where they would see 20% extra revenue on top of their ad revenue through subscriptions. They charge 7.99 euros for an extra episode every single week and ad free. Um, and what we've seen recently is they're now seeing um, on a monthly basis 59% or 58% I think it is extra revenue on top of their ad revenue. So this is a very additive medium. It doesn't cannibalize on our advertising side at all and offers, opportun offers opportunities for our creators to earn more revenue from different sources. We look to, to roll out ACAST Plus to um, in some form later this year. And then on the US scale and reach side, we've done an incredible job in the US. Um, a way to look at that that is to look at how we have scaled. So if we're the marketplace of choice um, for advertisers, we need scale and reach. We need to offer um, targeting and digital metrics to 
advertisers who want scale and reach, which is that big brand money that's moving across from radio to podcasting. So PodTrack is a, a unofficial but kind of a industry official chart within the US. We're not um, part of that chart. However, um, if you look at where we would sit in that chart, it gives you a good idea as to how we have scaled and what our reach is in the US. So, you know, if you look at on a monthly basis, on average, 80 million Americans listen to podcasts. Um, we represent 14 million. So we serve a podcast to 14 million Americans on a monthly basis. In that chart, we would sit comfortably at the number three spot for US reach, and we'd sit at the number one spot for um, global reach and scale, highlighting what we've built within our marketplace and the opportunity to continue to scale and grow that reach. And I think that um, is it. Yes, it is. There we go. Thank Here's you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ross and, uh, and Emily. Uh, for that, uh, uh, I mean, clearly you're having great success with uh, with strong growth in in uh, revenues, listens, monetization uh, across regions, and and the number of shows hosted with you. Uh, but I was wondering if you could um, uh, elaborate a bit on why uh, podcasters uh, choose uh, you instead of of any of the other hosting services that uh, may be out there. Yeah. You know I think it's a good question. Podcasting is, you know, a global proposition. We serve, uh, we represent, um, you know, podcasts in, you know, predominantly, you know, 12 markets, but it's listened to in 150 plus, you know, countries. So it's a very global proposition. And if you want to be fully efficient at monetizing that, you need to have local salespeople on the ground because, you know, uh, local advertisers are exactly who you need to target. They're not necessarily global. So for us, we are that proposition. We focus from an international standpoint. Also, as you look at the space and how fragmented it is right now, you need to have that independent player that is agnostic to any platform. And we are completely agnostic to where we distribute content to. So if you want, as a creator, the biggest reach and the biggest monetization opportunity and the biggest growth opportunities, you need to be on all platforms. And you need a simple technology, which is ours, which is a drag and drop technology and a simple click to monetize your show. So that's why people are choosing us amongst other things as well. Gotcha, makes, uh, makes perfect sense. Um, uh, and then I was wondering if, uh, could you talk a bit uh, more about your, your strategy for, for the US? Uh, like what, what makes you stand out uh, amongst the, the competitors there and, um, and how will you win this market basically? A, a great question again. I think, you know, US is a very different market, like I'd mentioned in the presentation. And by a different market, you know, if we, if we kind of step back slightly, the US, um, uh, unlike Europe, did have a commercial model within podcasting. But it was basically, you know, brands going direct to podcasters, podcasters reading live um, those ads within those podcasts, essentially baking them in. We came along and disrupted that, saying, look, dynamic ad insertion is the norm. You should be able to, you know, now track your ads so you know exactly the impressions and uniques you're reaching um, to your media mix and your campaign. You know, the brand uh, advertising agencies that are piling into podcasting now and buying that reach and scale, that's what they demand. So now the market has started to adopt dynamic ad insertion as the predominant technology. What that means is because we know that advertisers are local, advertisers or predominantly local, advertisers will say, I want a U.S only reach please now what we find is that between 15 and 30 percent uh, of u.s produced content is listened to outside the u.s so if you want to be fully efficient at representing that content from a monetization standpoint you need to not only monetize it incredibly well in the u.s but you need to monetize it well outside of the u.s and that's exactly what we do we released a stat a couple of weeks ago stating that our top 100 u.s hosted shows 22 percent of their reach actually happens outside of the US. So the opportunity for us is to almost a, an outside in approach and growing that international opportunity whilst also taking on those US sales. Also, US has a lot of local um, representation, i.e. you know, publishers represent themselves in that market. So when you've got advertisers who want reach and scale, you've got a fragmented market of lots of small players. So they naturally then focus towards the marketplaces who can offer reach and scale and targeting and tracking. And that's, again, the technology we've built. 
The future of the space is going to be around programmatic and automatic buying. Uh, also, how you can target podcasting in a more granular way from a conversational um, standpoint. So contextual targeting. We've built that technology. We're um, iterating on that right now. And we're scaling that. And we're seeing a big demand from an automatic basis. That's what we believe that our strategy is the one that's going to win in this space. Gather that, um, and uh, and when it comes to um, uh, to content, I, I know you're going after both bigger names as well as smaller names. But do, do you have any like particular content signings of late to um, uh, to highlight? Uh, and also, I was wondering if like how do you how do you go after when you really want to like uh, get a head start in in the US and and sign some bigger names? How how do you go about approaching uh, approaching these uh, these creators? I mean, there's, there's, the, there's a variety of ways that we can um, attract content. You know, there is a uh, naturally we have a platform where thousands of podcasts are joining on a monthly basis, and they're automatically joining. Apologies for my dog barking in the background. Um, uh, but actually, if we look at some of the the, the, the larger shows, uh, which create kind of network effects and attract more creators, you know, it's it's we have more of a uh, a manual approach in how we approach that talent. Um, so in the US, you know, recently we signed the likes of the Young Turks. We signed, you know, hundreds of new shows or thousands of new shows actually in the US. But um, I think I'd pick out the Young Turks as a really key one um, there. Uh, we're signing publishers as well as key independents. And, and again, once you start to sign key content um, that wants to grow in an open ecosystem, which, you know, a majority of all podcasts do because they want to get the biggest monetization opportunity and the biggest reach and scale. We start to attract new ones through those network effects that those bring. We see that in other markets. Look at UK. We represent you know 70 plus percent of the commercial market and all the content there. Uh, uh, in Sweden, over 50 percent of the market is with Acast. So um, that's the strategy we've had, and we're copy repeating that in the US. Okay, and I think we have time for one one final question. And, and sort of on that note, um, uh, do you have any plans on uh, sort of un intensifying your your marketing efforts in in terms of marketing your own brand going forward? Uh, I get that uh, your shows they they market themselves uh, to some extent, and and you can also market uh, some of your shows on other shows yep. that that you host. Uh, but but how are you working with with your own brands or particularly again uh, towards yes. po podcasters? Yep, you know, for us, it's about how do we aggressively grow that in each and every market, especially in the US. And, you know, how do we become more well known and a more of a household name? So when you are a creator, you instantly think Acast. Um, the key to that is using our creators. You know, our creators uh, love our platform. We need them to talk more about that. So, you, you know, you'll probably start to see more noise around that from our creators. Where you start to see the Acast logo on different cover arts as well. So we're getting our brand out there as much as possible. Plus, you know, from a marketing perspective, you know, the money we've raised, um, you know, we're looking at how we can start to promote um, our brand and how we do that through SEA and SEO, et cetera. So um, there's lots of ways we're going to start to market Acast. Em, is there anything you wanted to, to add to that? No, I'd just say keep an eye out for those um, big business mags in the US and interviews with Ross over the coming weeks. Okay, th thank you very much, Ross and Emily. I think uh, that was a really good uh, presentation and, and a great way to, to end the day and, and the seminar as well, I think. So... Uh, so thank Pleasure. you very much. Thanks, thanks for, for having thanks us. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Thanks, Derek. Cheers, Thanks.